Welcome back to the North Tonawanda Football Hall of Fame YouTube channel. Once again, we have another great guest from Bluefield, Virginia, former soldier in the U.S. Army, a great story, member of the 2009 North Tonawanda State Championship team, now playing NAIA college football for Bluefield, Bluefield College in Bluefield, Virginia, the one and only Colin O'Donnell. Colin, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you, Ed. Thank you for having me. I don't know where to begin, quite frankly, with you. <laughs> I mean, you, you, uh, better yet, let's start with the beginning with you. If you don't mind, talk about a little bit of you, uh, growing up in North Tonawanda, your family life, and how you got into high school football. Yeah, so football has always been an integral part of my life. I've been playing since, uh, shoot, 2000 or 2001, and, um, you know, um, we moved from the Sweet Home School District to North Tonawanda when I was in middle school. Um, so the opportunity to play football, no matter where I was at, was an integral part of, uh, of just who I am. Um, growing up, it was me, my mom and my sister. Um, you know, things weren't uh, very easy um, all the time. And so the opportunity to take out, you know, the pent up aggression of a young man on the field uh, and, and play football was was a very important part of my life for sure. You played on the 2019 team. You won the state championship at the Carrier Dome in Syracuse. What what do you remember from that magical season? There is, you know, there's too, almost too much to remember. I, I remember it just like it was yesterday. I remember walking past Franco's there just behind the high school. I remember seeing the signs up, you know, go, go Jacks 13 and no, you're going to get there. And I remember the town supporting us unequivocally. I remember the stands packed, you know, to the brim people standing along the side of the fences. Um, I remember coach Jancy giving a speech that say at the end of the game, he said, um, not everyone's perfect as an individual, but together you finished as a perfect team. And um, I just remember how starstruck I was by by the seniors on that team that year and, and how ambitious they were to tell us after that um, awful Orchard Park loss in 2008 at the at the uh, Ralph Wilson Stadium at the time. I remember all of them telling us, you know, there's no excuses. You guys are going to get in the weight room, not next month, not, you know, in a couple months. You're getting in the weight room this week and the state championship season starts tomorrow. And, and it did. And the next day we were working out, running and getting after it. And it did not stop through summer. I remember Michael Tuzo, quarterback, telling the Tonawanda News at the time that we were going to win the state championship in June of 2009. And I remember getting in trouble as a team for, for him saying something so audacious to the, to the media. And, um, but he called it and we did. And we went after it and we didn't make any excuses for ourselves. It's an amazing story. It really was. I mean, I, I was at, at several of the playoff games and, and also at the Carrier Dome, and it was electric that day when you beat uh, New Rochelle 14 to 7. Fast forward to the following year. You had a good team, good season. Um, didn't work out as well as a state championship. What do you remember about that uh, 2010 season? I remember, I remember us feeling a little bit confused because I feel like we, we were so on top of the world that we had just assumed that that was our place, you know, uh, amongst uh, other teams. And so we felt like, I, I feel like we didn't have to do as much. And so that was kind of the consensus. Um, we felt like the big guys on the block, we didn't have to go as hard or do as much. But the reality is if you want to be a champion, it doesn't end after you become a champion. It, it gets more difficult. You have to fight to stay in that position way harder than you did to get to that position. It's much easier to be the underdog in any given situation than it is to stay the top dog. And so um, I do remember um, having some electric wins, for example, over Niagara Falls. We were going into that game 0-2, I remember, I believe. We lost to Lockport and then, uh, and then Ken West at home. And so we were going in 0-2 for the first time in like a decade. And um, I just remember pulling that win off and, and going in. And that was the first year we started playing the Buffalo Public Schools as well. So I remember playing Riverside for the first time. And um, just uh, it was just kind of like a feeling of like, oh, like how could we lose after everything we just did? And um, it, it woke me up to the fact that in order to stay top dog, you have to live that lifestyle every single day. Coach Jancy has a magic way with linemen. 
Uh, he was a lineman as well, too. He was the offensive line coach under Coach Anastasi and, and the offensive coordinator. What do you say about Coach Chancey? Well, you couldn't say enough about Coach Chancey. He, he's a quiet, humble man that shows up to work every day and, and gets after it with his guys. Um, my, being a lineman for North Tonawanda was one of the funnest things that I've ever done, not just because – I had the opportunity to play between the two Shreve twins or um, along, you know, the best offensive line that um, North Tonawanda ever produced. But because every single day when we were running that triple option, it was head first, you know, going and getting after it. And um, so Coach Jancy knew that we were going to get after it in game day. And he made sure to not just train us hard, but also take care of his guys um, on and off the field. And we knew that we could go to him for anything down in the science wing and, and, and talk with him just about anything, any time of the day. What do you recall from the Indiana camps and, and what you got out of them? <laughs> the Indiana camps. Uh, we still, that's still a topic of discussion today amongst uh, uh, players from that time period. The Indiana option camps were one of the most difficult things I've done to date, uh, including the military and everything else. Um, Indiana Option Camp is a grueling um, three-a-day camp where you are just – there's no time for the sweat to dry off your pads. You better just start dumping baby powder and hope that you can make it through the day because um, that is just a miserably hot, um, exhausting camp. And um, But it's a great time because you will never be closer to the men next to you than, than a camp like that. I mean, it truly – um, <laughs> it'll wake you up um, pretty quickly to the reality of football. And then that opportunity too, to be with other schools who run the triple option, big schools, you know, six, a schools from around the country um, wakes you up to the real size of men in, in the game of football around the country, for sure. <laughs> After high school, you went to junior college, you kind of lost your focus a little bit. I think that's a fair assertion that, that to say at this point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you, you gained a, a whole bunch of weight. You didn't do very well in school. Um, then you made it somewhere. You made a, a decision you were going to join the army, and then you had to shed all that weight as well. Too. What was going on with you at that point in your life? Well, I was very, very confused, and um, you know, I, I was a very lost, young man, and um, I was searching for purpose. I was searching for something. I felt like there was more to the world than just a community college. I felt like I had to do something or there was something more for me. And so um, community college wasn't sparking that, that deep desire within me that I was looking for it to spark that, that level of creativity. And um, I was sitting in the parking lot at, at NCCC and um, I heard a radio broadcast that a sergeant had died in Iraq. This was this had to have been 2012. This was, yeah, fall 2011. And uh, that a sergeant had died in Iraq and he's leaving behind um, three kids, a wife, uh, so on and so forth. And I just remember thinking to myself, my grandfather served in World War II um, and, and they sacrificed everything. And, and this guy who I don't even know uh, is leaving behind all these kids and his wife. I said, what is my excuse to not go serve my country? I'm a single young man. I have nothing else to give myself right now. Um, I feel like I'm just kind of wasting away. And um, the military was always something I admired very, very, very much. And so I went over to the Air Force recruiting station first and I said, uh, you know, can I join? Is this possible? And they are very bluntly honest with you. They're like, you got to lose some weight. There's no way you're joining the Air Force. And I was like, oh, OK, well, can you help me do it? And they're like, no, you got to do this on your own. And so I went next door to the army recruiter and I said, listen, I need help losing this weight. Uh, can you help me? And Staff Sergeant Simon said, let's get to work. And that's exactly how it happened. And so 75 pounds were lost before I had even left for basic training and almost another 25 while I was in basic training. So just about 100 pounds total by the time basic training was said and done. What was the time period for all of that? Ooh, it took a while. So um, 2012 spring semester was my last semester in NCCC. And then by October 26, 2012, I was um, uh, enlisting in the Army. So it took, um, I was taking dramatic action. I mean, eating nothing but watermelon, yogurt, asparagus um, type diet restrictions on myself, um, running and going to the gym three or four times a day. 
Um, I just I totally abused myself to, to get my mind right and to fix my body. Um, I would say it probably took a total of about seven months before I was able to enlist. But um, every single day I was getting after it. Was it your intention to make it a career or you were just going to stay for five or six years? Yeah, going in, I definitely was, uh, I saw myself as a, a lifer, as they say, and um, I was excited to serve my country. I was super gung-ho, um, you know, upbeat. I knew everything that I could know about the Army. You know, uh, you know, I, I practiced and, and got my mind right before going. Um, and, and as I got in and everything it had unfolded, um, it just became apparent that, it, you know, that wasn't my path. That wasn't the, the path that I was supposed to be on. From basic training... Um, what was the time, how long was the time period before you were then, uh, deployed to Kandahar in Afghanistan? Yeah. So shoot, we got out of basic training in, uh, June, 2013, um, after one station unit training, it took about six months at Fort Leonard Wood. Um, I got to my unit at Fort Polk later that month. I took a couple weeks leave and then, uh, about a month after that, we got our orders um, to start training up for Afghanistan. And so um, by late July, it was on our radar and they had told us, um, hey, you're going to be going overseas. This is going to be this is for real and um, we need to start training. And then by shoot, it was February or March 2014. We were out the door. So seven months after basic training and, and we were gone. What was the purpose of your unit in Afghanistan? Because you were hurt in a cleanup detail, for lack of a better way to describe it. Yeah, so our unit was tasked with cleaning up um, bridge pieces from a, a um, blown up bridge that the Taliban had basically tried to dismantle with explosives. And then the other part of it was um, at the time, um, this is still the Obama administration. So they were doing a drawdown of forces in Afghanistan. And, um, you know, we we were fully expecting no U.S. forces by the end of 2014, which is basically what we were told. So um, we had thought we were going there basically to pack connexes and just run security details. Um, but our first mission came up and um, the Taliban had um, blown up a bridge. And so we were sent to clean it up. And something that... Um, that sits with me that I've had to reflect on a lot, uh, like a real lot. It's taken me years to really um, accept what had happened and everything. And, and I've come to a, a place of peace since then. Um, but what had happened was uh, everything is still um, speculatory in nature. And so although we think we know what happened on that cleanup detail, the details of the situation are much more vague where we believe that um, harsh chemicals did infiltrate my foot and my sergeant's hand. I mean, his whole hand started to blister and peel and fall off. Whereas I had severe problems in my left foot, um, which was exposed through a hole in my boot. But the reality of the situation, no real investigation was ever concluded or finished or done. And so we were going off of what the medical doctors were telling us and um, the test results, which showed high levels of exposure to radioactive properties, which, um, wreaked havoc on my body for sure. My sergeant, um, who was on the mission with me, he got off a little easier. Um, I wouldn't say easier. He, he lost some of the skin on his hand, but he was able to receive treatment faster. Um, by the end of the day, about shoot, it was probably about a week later, we found out um, after the um, injury had fully taken place, which took about two weeks to develop, by the way, the symptoms started showing up rather quickly. Um, but over the course of the next couple of weeks, uh, it just wreaked havoc on me and him. He got medical treatment a little faster than I did. And, and I thought my foot was just hurting from rucking all over Afghanistan. Um, but after, after the couple of weeks had ended and I got to the hospital and we had emergency surgery on my foot, we found um, two different kinds of MRSA infections, uh, staph infections and bone infections and um, blood infections as well. That was just uh, tearing me up. Um, my foot was about two, three times its normal size. So they did an emergency surgery on it in Kandahar and then sent me over to Germany. Um, and I was quarantined there for two weeks while they tried to figure out what was going on. Um, and then I was sent back to Walter Reed um, in, in Bethesda, Maryland there um, to receive additional treatment and, and recover um, and rehabilitate. But um, 
it's been a really difficult process because as, as much as I want to say definitively, this cleanup detail um, 100% caused this injury, um, I, I'll never know the full truth of what happened to me. And it's been very, uh, it's been a difficult process accepting that, but I've come to, I've come to a sense of peace with it. One of the local TV stations in Buffalo did a story about you and accidentally they said that you you were blown up. Yes. And, and, and that caused a little bit of problem because that information got back to your unit. Um, and then while at Walter Reed, uh, you were, you were meeting other people. You were meeting, uh, Congressman Lewis, uh, Senator McCain, uh, the president. And there was a little bit of um, your, your unit was kind of disowning you. Is that a, is that a fair statement to say? Yeah. Um, and what you just mentioned, this is the first time I've ever actually spoken on this subject in an interview, not just wrote it myself. So I appreciate this opportunity because this part of my life uh, eclipses everything else that occurred uh, with Walter Reed, Afghanistan, the recovery, the surgeries. This part hurt more than anything else. Um, the men that I deployed with were unequivocally, and, and many still are, my brothers, and I love them to death. I would drop what I'm doing and do anything I can to help them at any given moment. Um, and so when, when that mistake was made, it was grave. It was grave in morale, for my unit back in Afghanistan, who is, who is getting rocketed every day. Um, it was grave for me um, because those individuals who were living in awful conditions in Afghanistan, um, they started messaging me and, and those messages were violent in nature. They were, uh, you know, to, to say, Hey, we're coming for you. If, if you think you're going to lie to national media. And so I went to my chain of command at Walter Reed and I said, listen, there's a huge mistake. There's a huge misunderstanding here. And um, they talked to me. They sat me down. They said, listen, they're like, Colin, uh, these mistakes happen. When, when the media was with us in Afghanistan, they misreported a ton of stuff. And I said, I, I understand that. But, you know, this is really affecting my personal life. And it took um, years to rebuild relationships with those guys once the truth really came out. But part of the part of the problem with being deployed is, you don't get a lot of information. So the information you do get is usually rumor based and it's usually um, uh, condensed with, with um, personal opinion, um, you know, just non facts. And so the information that they were hearing was so dramatically different from the truth of what was actually happening. So to my unit in Afghanistan, I was getting showered with gifts and appreciation for being you know, just this, um, the epitome of a wounded warrior. Um, and, and, you know, I was lying about service. Whereas the reality of the situation was I was extremely confused as to what was happening, uh, myself. And so I lost that year, a lot of good friends and brothers because of miscommunication and, and an accident. I had, um, I sent an email to WIVB and I asked them, uh, to remove it. And that was the extent which my chain of command suggested I go. And my chain of command also sent an email and um, it just never, the article stayed the same. And we accepted that that was the issue. But moving forward, I was able to control the situation by living my truth, living my light and explaining to people what had really happened and, and gone on. You spent two years at Walter Reed. You saw a lot of different things. You had numerous surgeries well over seven, I believe, that I read in, in your blog. What was going through your mind during that time period? Depression on a level that is almost unexplainable. Um, and, and truly, if we're going to be entirely honest with one another here, um, it, was, um, it was a very difficult time. And, and the reason it was difficult was because I'm surrounded by heroes, left, right, front, center, and back. Everywhere I look, I was surrounded by people who truly, truly gave something for their country. Uh, uh, despite me voluntarily joining and, and being in the army, I never actually felt like I had given my all to my country. I didn't feel like I gave what I could have to my country. And so looking around at these men who gave limbs, multiple limbs, are on their 88th surgery, have been in the hospital for six or seven years, 
and seeing what they have sacrificed for the country while I'm there on, you know, an unknown assertion of an injury was very, very difficult to, to see. Um, I gained a lot of inspiration from the men that I served with at Walter Reed and recovered with. Um, some of those men were wounded in ways which are entirely inexplicable. Um, and they were able to get up every day. And so despite the fact that I, I had lost my unit in Afghanistan, I was by myself in the hospital at Walter Reed. I, all I had to do was look left and right for a little bit of inspiration. And um, over the course of my time there, I was able to bring myself out of that, that very, very dark time um, in my life at Walter Reed. You were very fortunate to meet President Obama. You also were summoned to the White House on your 21st birthday because President Obama wanted to have a share a beer with you on your birthday. Talk about that experience, would you please? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so I was invited to the White House in August of 2014 to receive the Presidential Call to Service Award, which basically it um, recognizes individuals who have gone above and beyond in their volunteer service to their country. And so um, I'd done some research on the White House. I'm a huge history guy. And I found out that he's the first president to actually um, brew alcohol since uh, George Washington. So, uh, and the only one to do it in the White House. And so I was like, well, th I think that's pretty cool. And the, they used honey fr um, from honeybees on the campus of the White House itself. And I thought, man, that's really, that's detail oriented. That's the kind of beer I would love to drink. And um, so when we got to the White House, he, uh, President Obama had asked me, he said, hey, you're the guy from Buffalo, right? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, uh, hey, how, the, how do those bills look? And, you know, it's 2014, the Rex Ryan era. And I was like, ah, oh, you know, not, not too good this year, but we'll see how it goes, I guess. And he was like, yeah. And so he, he gave me the award. And just before he moved on, I said, uh, hey, I was wondering, you know, uh, I heard you guys brew your own beer here. And he said, yeah, that's correct. And I said, I was wondering if you'd like to share one with me for my 21st birthday. And the, lo <laughs> the looks that everyone else in that room gave me for asking the president if he wants to share a beer for, for my 21st was uh, I, I was a fortunate man to get out of there uh, uh, without getting in any trouble from, from command because uh, that was pretty bold of a young PFC at the time to, uh, to do. And uh, he took down my number and he said, we'll give you a call. And sure enough, I was uh, putting some laundry in later that evening. And um, I got a call from a private number and it was the White House of the United States on behalf of the president. And, um, you know, summoning me to a, a, a beer. Uh, I, I forgot the exact word that they that the woman had used, but it was like a beer excursion of some of some sort. Um, a real funny word that I, I just I thought was hilarious that this call was even coming through. And um, the president ultimately, after um, some military advisors had, had talked to him and said, it was probably not a good idea for the president to be directly sharing a beer with with a younger enlisted um, soldier for reprisal reasons. So I get a knock on my door about, well, about two weeks later, just under two weeks. And um, it was a colonel from the Pentagon. And the colonel said the president of the United States called me at my office in the Pentagon because I in my file, it said that I worked at um, at the time it was Rich Stadium in, in, in Buffalo. He said I, I had worked at Rich Stadium, the Bills games, and he found me and called me in my office and said there's a young soldier from Buffalo at Walter Reed that needs me to go get him, bring him down to the lobby because there's a gift waiting for him. And so the president actually found a guy from Buffalo uh, to come to my room at Walter Reed, pick me up brought me down to the, the lobby at Walter Reed where um, six White House Honey Al beers were waiting for me in a bag with an uh, invitation back from the president and a card from him and uh, Mrs. Obama as well. Wow. <laughs> it's, it's simply amazing. Do you ever think about this and, and look back at this stuff in retrospect? This is only about the half of your, half of your life going right now from, 20, from 2009. You ever look back and say, wow, not bad from a kid from North Tonawanda. Yeah, you know, we're always told, it's funny you say that. I was thinking about this the other day. We're always told uh, when we're younger, we should dream as big as possible and we're encouraged to do it. Something happens though between childhood and, and teenage years and adulthood and where we, 
we start to settle for more uh, mediocrity than we wish we would have. You know, when we were kids, we picture ourselves riding the fire trucks or, or playing in the NFL game or, or making the big play. And those dreams over time, they just kind of fade away. And so for me, um, I knew from a very early age, um, you know, in the high school and, and post high school that I just did not want to settle for an average life. It just has always bothered me. And so I've always tried to do as much as possible. And one of the things the guys here say are uh, I'm the guy who's lived 10 lives in 10 years, you know? Um, and, and so they kind of feed off of that experience, but yeah, you know, uh, any, whether it's North Tonawanda or a small town in, uh, next to Indiana option camp, um, anyone's capable but there's a lot of work and sacrifice involved, you know? All right, we'll keep, we'll keep going with the story. You're discharged from Walter Reed. You're discharged from the Army. You come back to Western New York, I think North Tonawanda. Yep. You, you, you take on a job. You're working 70 to 80 hours a week, setting all kinds of uh, standards and, and records with this company, uh, buying some things. You have a place to live. You've I think you've had a boat and some other things that you, that yeah. you had. And all of a sudden, he said, this isn't for me anymore. And you sold everything off and then went back to uh, living with friends and staying on their couches. Um, and then at that point, you were, I, correct me if I'm wrong, you were also getting yourself involved with athletes of, of, valor, of valor. You'd gone back to school. Um, 4.0. I mean, what was going through that, that chapter of, uh, in your life as well? You, you, you've got a lot of chapters in your life for 10 years. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So this, this chapter I would define as a page being flipped and, and the switch being flipped. And so when I was at Walter Reed, just before you leave, you have to show proof of employment because what they're trying to avoid is they don't want you homeless. They don't want you without a job. And so I, you know, proof of employment, uh, what is your plan? And, and here's the safest route for you. And, and the way that, you know, and good on them for doing it because it works for a lot of people, right? It's get a job, uh, you, use uh, your veteran status on a resume as a booster and use the experience from the army to help you transition into the civilian world. Um, here's how you buy a house. Here's how you get a car. You know, they go through all of these real life scenarios with you. And um, so getting out of the army, when you don't know what's next, it's a very safe bet to go grab a, a, a decent job and, and start renting your own place. And so that's what I did. And, and working for Orkin Wildlife and Pest Control was a fantastic job. It paid very well. I was able to work whatever hours I wanted to. And more than anything, I just wanted to prove myself like you know, being in the hospital for so long, people, I felt like had almost counted me out. I didn't want to be viewed as a disabled veteran. So I was, I was willing to do anything for that company, upwards of 82 and a half hours a week of work, Monday through Sunday, taking care of customers and just getting it done and getting paid. And so, you know, I'm having a good time. I'm getting the ATVs, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, I have a backyard, a, a, a jacked up Jeep and, um, and I was living what, many would consider a successful life after a transitioning from the army. But again, like I had previously said, something is, is missing. If I'm living, if I'm living within a normal standard of deviation, something's wrong and, and I can feel it deep down and it's almost um, unexplainable where I feel it or how I feel it. But I just know that I'm not on the right path if I feel comfortable. And so anytime I get comfortable, I feel like I always have to level up in, in a way and um, this time in my life, I became very, very comfortable. Um, I, I was eating a little bit too much, um, not working out as much. And I had fallen in love with my material possessions far too much to um, accept personally. And so um, I just decided to give it all up. I knew that I had left some stuff on the table back after high school. I had some Division three offers and, and I always wondered, could I play college football? Um, it, it, you know, it wasn't for me at that time. I wasn't able to do it, but um, I just decided, you know what, if, if this is the life if, if that we're supposed to live from start to finish, then I might as well do it with a bang. And, and if, and if this is the biggest risk I take, I think it's worth it. 
And so uh, I ended up selling everything um, minus uh, my dog <laughs> um, and uh, the Jeep at the time, which is now gone. I sold it for the business. But um, I, yeah, just about everything except a box of clothes. And um, I started going to the gym again like I was before the army. Um, and that switch, like that I was talking about, it just flips, right? Where it, it just becomes go mode. And um, I had um, just found the inspiration that I was looking for. And um, I just got to work. And it was an awesome, awesome feeling. And yeah, Athletes of Valor, um, I contacted them and I said, listen, I'm a veteran that wants to play football again. And that's, the, that's what their organization does. They give veterans who want to play co uh, collegiate sports again an, an opportunity to do so. And um, they gave me that opportunity to, to work on myself and they gave me the template to do it. And I did. It, it's simply amazing at that point. I've seen the video that you made. Besides a Bluefield College, were you contacted by any other colleges? Yeah, so I had three uh, colleges that had offered. Uh, Dartmouth uh, College up in, I believe they're New Hampshire. Um, and then uh, Bloomsburg in Pennsylvania and Bluefield College. And um, so what, and at the time, um, I didn't realize that Dartmouth was actually a, a really amazing offer for, for what it's worth. Um, but I knew one thing, and it, as crazy as it sounds, this is the biggest determining factor. I just wanted to get out of the cold and see if we could stay warmer than a few more months uh, than winter brought in Buffalo. And so um, I went down and visited the, the, uh, in the Appalachian Mountains uh, right on the border of North Carolina. I visited Bluefield College and I fell in love with it. And it's a small town. Um, it's a humble and quiet and slower town. But let me tell you what, it is a gorgeous, fresh air town. And, and I knew right away, um, didn't even tour the campus. And I said, this is it for me. It was unique that you had said um, you're not asking for a position on your team. You're asking for a chance to prove you could earn it. Yeah. Big, big difference at that point. Um, was that something that I think that swayed the coach at Bluefield when you made yeah, that statement? So, absolutely. So when I, when I first met with Coach Lusk and Coach Cackless, um, you know, I, I told them, Coach, I am the most motivated and dedicated individual you will ever ever meet. And, and I told them what I bench. I told them what I'm squatting. I told them how I'm getting better. Um, and I think, uh, and coach Lusk has admitted this. He, he, he'll say it. He thought I was a crazy man because my, you could see the flame in my eyes of how bad I wanted this opportunity. And so in the morning before school, I would get up at 4am and I would go to, um, crunch fitness over there in Tonawanda. And, um, I would long snap for an hour after my workouts every day, every single day I would long snap until I perfected it. And so even if they did not have a single position on the team for me in a physical manner, I knew that I could long snap and I could go to that coach and I, and I could say, you might, you might not value me at all, but I can long snap really, really well. And I know you could use that no matter what. And so I trained myself to long snap um, through excruciating training every day. Um, and, um, I went down there and I told them what I'm capable of. And mind you, I was a starting right guard for North Tonawanda. Um, and you know, him saying we have a middle, we have, you know, needs at the middle linebacker position, defensive line. He's like, do you think you can do that? And without hesitation, when that opportunity knocks, you don't think about it. You just say, absolutely. And I don't know how at the time, no idea how I was going to figure that out. I just knew that I, I knew that I would. And, um, so I, I, um, talked to them a little bit. And at the end of the tour, he said to me, um, Colin, would you like to sign a letter of intent to Bluefield college? And I said that, I said, that would make my day, sir. Yes, sir. And, um, so I was the first one out of class of 42 that day, um, that got to sign my letter of intent and, um, the only walk on, um, for Bluefield college in the 2018 season out of 142 or 43 people who were, who were coming out for camp. You go down the blue field, you pack up, uh, pack up the Jeep. You got Chloe, your dog next to you. You got a place that you think you're going to live at. Um, turned out to be a scam. Called the coach. Coach gets you hooked up pretty quick. 
and you start acclimating yourself, your body is beat up, uh, you overworked it, you know, uh, maybe a disc problem in your back, uh, a bad hammy at that point as well too. And you get down there and the trainers are wondering what the heck we got here. <laughs> That's that's uh, beyond accurate. That's the, I'm going to have to show my trainers this uh, this video after we're done because they're going to get a kick out of it. Um, they use me as a medical, uh, um, I guess, uh, trophy um, to their to the uh, the work of the trainers here because of how remarkable it is that they've managed to get me through the last few years here um, rather uh, healthy still. And um, yeah, that first year. Um, all the scar tissue from sitting at Walter Reed, even though I worked at um, Oregon, it was never nothing compares to the physicalness of college football. And, and um, I don't know what I expected in my head, but the violence involved with college football really took my body by storm. And even though I was training relentlessly every day um, to the point where I tore my hamstring just before going to, to Bluefield, about 35 days beforehand, um, and even though I was training relentlessly, nothing, nothing could fully prepare me or my body for what college football was. And so when they told me that they needed a defensive lineman, when I arrived for camp, I stepped up to the challenge. I learned three days. I learned every single play and, and I got it down. I read it, uh, or I'm sorry, I wrote it down in uh, um, like a regular sentence. I wrote all the plays down like a regular sentence. And then I wrote, all the plays down as if they were written in the playbook. And then I wrote it in cursive. And I did this with every single play in our defensive playbook until I had memorized it over and over again, dozens of pages. And um, so I get on the defensive line and I start hitting these six foot seven, <laughs> 340 pound uh, offensive guys. And, um, you know, it, it just ravaged my body. The swelling um, by the second week of camp was so significant. Um, that I could not turn my steering wheel to get onto my street. So I had to use my forearm and just rotate it around to try and turn the Jeep onto my street because my fingers wouldn't close anymore. My toes were so swollen that they went limp and the trainers weren't sure if I had just snapped all the tendons in my foot. Um, and they thought um, for about a week, they were wondering if I had undiagnosed rheumatoid arthritis to a severe extent. Um, and then after a few ice baths and, um, a lot of recovery, um, and a lot of good, they took care of me more than anyone has. Um, you know, I was able to recover and get through camp. Do you think that, uh, the coaches, uh, put you through these paces to see how tough you were and, and, uh, if you were the real deal? Absolutely. 100%. Absolutely. They, they knew I came down there talking, you know, a lot of smack, if you will, saying, I'm your guy, I'm going to get this done. And they did not, I mean, uh, special teams, field goal block, um, uh, field goal um, protection, uh, kickoff, kickoff return. They, they put me on every single thing for the first three weeks of camp to see if I was capable of doing nonstop practices like that. And um, despite immense pain, pain where – I had tears rolling down my eyes, just getting out of bed in the morning, trying to move my knees. Um, I was able to tape up, uh, take that 800 milligrams of Motrin, um, uh, say a prayer and get back on that field. And I, and I put in that work every single day. You never cried uncle, did you? No, sir. After your first year, you got, they put you on scholarship. Got to be a great feeling on that. You, 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 you passed their, passed their test. You've been playing at, at the, the fall season, except for this season is a spring season because of COVID. But in the meantime, you opened up a business, uh, I think a little bit prior to the pandemic, and you expanded it during the pandemic, a business called The Grind, a, a gourmet coffee shop and now restaurant. What, you, talk, you talked about wanting to give back to the community. Talk about your restaurant and giving back to the community, what that, what that means. So um, I had mentioned earlier that I felt like I didn't fulfill my highest obligations in the United States Army. And it was a really difficult regret that I had held deep within me for quite some time. And so um, this business is an extension of my service to my country in some way, shape or form. And that's not, you know, there's plenty of extensions. It goes many different directions, but that's one of them. And um, so I felt like I had to do something. I was, I'm very grateful, but beyond everything else, 
the, the, the level of gratitude that I have for Bluefield, my coaches, this community for taking me in, accepting me and, and, and putting me on scholarship and allowing me to live um, and re, redefine myself. Um, I can't even explain how, how grateful I am. And so this business was an extension of that gratitude in my community, um, my service to community and, and country. Um, the grind was an awesome, awesome project. And it started in 2019. Um, and then, yeah, so we won, we won the uh, entrepreneurial challenge, the pandemic hits and we are just lost in the sauce. We're like, what, what is a startup, you know, supposed to do, um, at the start of a pandemic? How are we supposed to get through this? And, um, we decided after it took about probably a month and a half of talking with our team, um, that we were going to do a food truck. We were just going to do a mobile drive through park that thing on the center of downtown, right in front of our building and just run a mobile <laughs> drive through operation. And um, it paid off uh, amazingly. You were well received and, and uh, you were very busy from the first day. And I'm sure it's still that way uh, today. Uh, one thing I, I found unique and, and reading about, or, or was a, a, a TV interview that you did when you were running a little low on funds to get buns for your hamburgers. So you decided you're going to put put hamburgers on bagels, and it took off wildly. Yeah. Um, I mean, my mouth is watering just thinking about that. It really is. I mean, talk about you know, how creative you had to be to to go from a, a small boutique to a, a really elegant shop uh, a store that that you have right now. Yeah. So. Uh... We, we got down to the final dollar. I mean, literally, um, I think opening day, my personal account was like negative $200 or something like that. And um, Tazewell County came to us and they said, hey, the first, the first round of CARES Act um, uh, emergency business grants are here. You know, do you need any help? And we were like, oh my, we were like, we need all the help right now. We need help. But it was too late. We had, op- we had been open for two days. Um, and so we had already started generating customer flows and, um, so that they, geez, it had to have been 12 hours before opening. We realized, oh my gosh, we don't have enough hamburger buns. We didn't get enough from the baker. We, we need to figure something out. And uh, so we, we looked, we looked around and I was like, guys, we have about 450 fresh baked bagels right here. And I was like, we need to put the bag, we need to put a bagel burger on the menu. And they were like, that'll never work. And I was like, listen, if you toast that bagel, I bet you it tastes delicious on there. And so we fired the grill up and we put one on there and we were like, this is going to, this is going to sell. And uh, sure enough, it became like our number one staple item. And we're carrying that, um, that item over into our uh, physical shop here as well. And yeah, we were able to, over the course of about three or four months, we not only rebounded, um, but we met with the IDA, the local town council um, and the chamber. And we were able to, to get the necessary investments to completely transform downtown. And so we went from uh, a negative $200 uh, <laughs> coffee startup to um, we're at just about over a half million dollars in total investment and, and re- renovation um, to our shop downtown that has completely revitalized um, the center of downtown. And um, as of this past week, I believe there are four or five new businesses coming downtown that are following our lead. So we're super happy to have them and, uh, and be able to expand. That's a, that's a tremendous story. Are you bringing any of your Western New York cuisine, anything on Kemmelweck or, 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 or wing sauce? <laughs> no, but I'll tell you this, we are going to be doing a runoff of the ice cap from Tim Hortons. Cause that is the number one thing I missed from back home uh, besides mighty taco, of course, was the Tim Hortons ice cap. And so we uh, engineered our own um, uh, recipe, if you will. And um, boy, it tastes pretty good and a, a little bit more fresh, if you would, too, um, from those freshly um, roasted beans. So um, we were able to engineer our own ice cap and we'll be serving that up, too. In 2020, you received the Armed Forces Merit Award presented by the Football Writers Association of America. You were one of three finalists on that. Tremendous that you won it, but what does that award mean to you? Well, it means the world. When I saw that I was even nominated, um, I texted Coach Lusk and I said, uh, "I'm I'm standing in the shadow of giants over here." And he said, "No," he said, "They call me Sergeant here." 
Um, he said, no, Sarge. He said, they're, they're standing in your shadow. And, um, you know, that's the kind of support that I have here. And, and it kind of tells you a lot about who that man is, who, who coaches our team. And, um, you know, some of the guys on that list, you know, if you had the opportunity to see it, unbelievable uh, resumes in, in the uh, college football and their private lives as well from um, a, a Navy SEAL defensive lineman who plays for Nebraska. You know, these are people who, who I hold in the absolute highest regard. And so for the Football Writers Association of America to, to look at me and say, you know what, you're our guy, you exemplify this, this award, uh, it means the world to me. And a lot of people will labor their entire lives. And I said this to the Football Writers Association of America as well. A lot of people will labor their entire lives without any recognition for the work that they do, but they'll continue to do it in good faith and service. And so to be able to be recognized for my work is a humbling experience. I don't take it for granted. I'm very grateful. You said you're called Sarge by your teammates. Um, do some of your opponents call you Pops or Gramps? Or <laughs> since, you, since you are an older, you've got to be probably 27, 28 years old right now. Yeah, so I'm 27, and the, and yeah, when I step on the fields, if if the right teammates are catching me at the right time, they ask me to show my AARP card before I step onto the field. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they call me Gramps. That's that's definitely one I heard. And it's funny because the sergeant part wasn't even militarily related. When I showed up, I was wearing a a, a bandana like a wrestling bandana, and so they called me Sergeant Slaughter, um, the wrestler from the 80s, and then it just turned into Sarge. And so, uh, you know, they, it's, it's funny how the role that I play because it's somewhere in between coach and player and no one can really define it. <laughs> You're a junior this year. You're probably going to play one more year. I've read that you want to go to law school. Would that be in Bluefield or, or going elsewhere or online or how's that going to work for you? Yeah. So I'm currently in the MBA program here at Bluefield college. And, um, so I would love to um, go to law school, but first I need to finish up this MBA. I want to take a little bit of time to really focus on the business because at this point we need to hire within the next month, we need to hire about 20 people um, and it, it's starting to consume a lot. And so I just want to take some time for the business, uh, make sure it's healthy, make sure it's managed correctly. And as long as those blocks are in place first, I would love to go um, and, and see if I could go maybe the UVA um, has been on my radar um, or other Ivy Leagues that I've been looking into. Um, but um, it's definitely on my radar, but the business comes first. And, you know, that's my baby right now. And, and making sure that we're, we're doing good by this community and, and keeping our word is number one. How are you managing your time? You've got a football season right now. You've got practices. You've got your classroom work to do. And you've got a business. You've got to have a, a disciplined and insane schedule. Yeah, that definitely is a good way to to describe it, to say the least. Um, I would say I would say that. And it, first off, we all have the same twenty four hours, and that's the most important thing to remember. We all have the same twenty four hours awarded to us in any given day. And so the way I use mine is um, I move from Buffalo to Bluefield, and I cut out a lot of the unnecessary chatter that takes up a lot of our time. I don't have a TV in my house, for example. I haven't owned a TV probably since 2016, but yet my business has five of them, you know what I mean? Um, and so it's it's the small things that save me a lot of time. Um, I try and wake up as early as possible. When we were getting the business started, um, I was up at 3 a.m. And so we would go through our college football workouts at 3 a.m. and then open the business up by six. And so it's that level of uh, time management and discipline time management that um, allows me to do all this. And um, there's a level of inspiration, too, that you need to have to be able to continue to push through it. So um, when sometimes my alarm wouldn't even go off at 3 a.m., I would just wake up at 2.55, you know what I mean? Ready to go and, and, and just taking my pre-workout and protein and I'm out the door. And so, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm inspired um, and I'm motivated. And... Um, time management is, is the pinnacle of everything that I do. I'm sure there's some young players that'll be viewing this video. What type of advice could you give them? What kind you of have them would they have them follow in your footsteps? I, I would have them. Uh, so 
if you know if they could fo- if it was possible to follow another human being exactly uh you know step for step i would love that because i think they would have a great time um living this but this my journey is my truth and they live a journey that is waiting for them right now that's their truth so if i had to tell them one thing i would tell them to to not be afraid to enter into the unknown i would tell them that complacency kills 100% of the time. It's not if or when, it's always. Complacency and comfortability is a slow, painful death. And um, I would tell them to remain uncomfortable while living their highest potential truth and go after what they want with absolutely everything that they have without any regard for what people think about it. One final question. And I appreciate your time today. Yeah. What did you take from that? the North Tonawanda football program that that you still apply to today? Anyone can win. Anyone who is willing to sacrifice can win. And that sacrifice is variable. You might have to sacrifice your Jeep like I did, or, you know, that boat that you got. You might have to sacrifice your time by getting to the weight room. You might have to sacrifice a little bit of sleep. You might have to sacrifice those friends who don't do anything but sleep on the couch or do drugs. But you can win. The underdog can win. You are no different than the individuals. And and this is something that always stuck with me. We are no different than the individuals who are at the the top of our economic classes or or our intellectual um, professors that, 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 you know, author amazing books. We have that capability within us. And to be the underdog from North Tonawanda and go in there and kick a new Rochelle team's butt uh, proved to me that anyone is capable of winning at any time as long as you're willing to sacrifice for it. Colin O'Donnell, this has been a fascinating conversation. I appreciate your time. I know you're a busy guy. Oh, it's just simply amazing reading about you and now having the opportunity to speak to you. I wish you well. I thank you so much. Good health to you going forward. Good luck with your business and your future. And thank you so much for joining me today. Ed, thank you so much. And thank you guys for your hard work and dedication to that YouTube channel. You guys are doing a fantastic job.